perspective. Once you have learned about it, you will see it everywhere. We live in a three-dimensional world. And in order to be able to depict this world on a two-dimensional space, like paper, we have to learn about perspective. But a lot of artists, me included, just dread it. But once you learn a couple of basics, you will realize that it's not that complicated. And also there are certain tips and tricks which can make it easier for you. Or you can be extremely precise if you want to. So, with this video I want to introduce everybody to the basics of perspective but also go into a little bit more detail for everybody who knows the basics of perspective but is still kind of struggling with it. I myself figured out what kind of typical mistakes I do when I work with perspective and oh boy was making this video helpful to me. So hopefully I can share some of this knowledge with you and maybe it will help you too. So let's talk about it. and welcome to another video of visual storytelling with Olshi. I'm Olshi and here on this channel we talk about creating manga, comics and anything art related. So first of all, why do we need to learn about perspective? Well, actually you could create a comic without perspective, if that's your style. But that would be a much more abstract style, further away from reality. If you want your backgrounds to look more realistic, then you need perspective. As I said before, we live in a three-dimensional space. There is left and right, up and down, but also forward and backwards. Manga is a 2D medium. And maybe one day there will be a 3D manga experience, but I seriously cannot imagine it, because then it will be like a game or a movie. But as of now, manga and comics are read on either paper or a digital screen, so on a 2D space. So in order to show the depth and the distances and the foreshortenings that appear in the three-dimensional space on a 2D surface, we need perspective. So perspective simply makes things more realistic, but it can also help you to create certain moods and effects in order to emphasize certain emotions or tension. So it is an extremely useful tool. Let's start with the very basic for those of you who might not have heard anything about perspective yet or for whom it has been a while since they learned it. Maybe you were lucky enough to have learned about it in school or maybe you haven't. So here we go. One, one point perspective. The one-point perspective is the most basic one and the most easy to understand. First, within the panel you have your horizon line, which represents the viewer's eye level. And everything that is above the horizon line is above the viewer, and everything that is below the horizon line is below the viewer. And everything that is on the horizon line has basically the same height as the viewer. And if you as a viewer go down, then the horizon line goes down as well. With one point perspective you have one vanishing point which can lie anywhere on the horizon line. All the parallel lines which lead away from the viewer meet at this one point. So in a room the lines of the ceiling, floor, window seals all follow that one vanishing point. Pretty simple, right? The vanishing point doesn't have to be at the center of the picture. Most of the time a panel benefits from having the vanishing points a little bit further to the right or to the left of the picture sometimes it can even be outside of the picture. Unless you're Wes Anderson, then most of your frames have one central vanishing point. With this alone you already create a lot of depth within a drawing. But there are certain things you have to consider in order to create a more realistic space. For example, objects on the same plane converge the further away they are from the viewer and the closer they are to the vanishing point. So not only do the windows here get smaller, they also get slimmer and the distance between them converges as well. By how much does it converge? Well, you can eyeball it, but there are certain rules that can help you out here. In this case, you can use the cross rule. Okay, let's say you want to draw a house with a pointy roof in perspective. Usually this pointy bit is at the middle of the house and you can measure the middle, the center of that side by drawing like a cross from connecting the opposite corners. And this is where the middle will be. And this is the rule that you use for perspective as well. Let's turn on the perspective ruler. So okay, here you have the side of the house and 
Now you measure the middle of the side by drawing across, connecting the opposite corners again. So this is where the middle will be. So now you can draw the actual roof. Obviously, you want to add more three-dimensionality to it. You can extend the roof because, and then continue drawing. In. And this roof would be parallel to this line. So basically, this distance is the same as this distance in perspective. And this is how you use the cross rule. You can use the cross rule in the reverse as well. Let's say you want to draw a fence. And where you have poles, well, those poles have to be at even distances. So what you do is you start with the, like the biggest pole and then you just like decide where the next pole would be roughly. So in order to determine where the third pole would be, basically you just find the middle of this one and then you draw a line from the top of this pole through the middle of this pole and connect it to this vanishing line. And where this diagonal meets the vanishing line, this is where your third pole would be. The center will be always the, at the same vanishing line for each pole. So now you don't even have to measure it and you just continue doing that. This way you draw a much more realistic background. Of course, you don't have to be that precise. With enough practice, you eventually will probably be able to just eyeball it. But in order to have more believable backgrounds, the cross rule can be pretty useful. And also, even if you do develop a good intuition, sometimes it's good to go back to some of these rules just to make sure that what you drew is kind of in the correct space. But then again, most backgrounds do not have this kind of evenly spaced objects in them. Usually you have a, let's say you have a street, there you have just buildings that have different kind of width, the windows have different sizes. So in order to still try and be more precise, remember this rule of thumb, the closer something is to the vanishing points, the more flat it becomes. This is a very common mistake for beginners and a little bit more advanced artists. They just draw the foreshortened side way too long. And I am totally guilty of that. I probably drew this perspective more often wrong than I did it right. So if you have to draw a street or a valley or a hallway, maybe try to find some reference pictures and see how the foreshortening works there. The windows often become mere stripes the further away they are from the viewer. And again, you can eyeball it or you can also create a kind of perspective grid using the diagonal rule. So here's how you use the diagonal rule. First, draw a room, then decide where your vanishing point and your horizon line gonna be. I already created it here with the perspective ruler. Then I draw just a random line parallel to the horizon line here in the room. Then while turning the perspective ruler off, I mark just even distances on, on this line. And obviously I cannot use the ruler directly here. So what I do is just like copy and paste and then just place them evenly. Okay, once you have that, I turn on the perspective ruler again and then I draw the vanishing lines from each of those points. Then I uh, draw another random line, parallel line here. Doesn't really matter how far it is, shouldn't just be like too much of a distance. Then I turn off the perspective ruler so that um, my line doesn't snap to the perspective ruler. And then I draw a diagonal through this first square. Only I extend it to the this corner of the room, but I make sure that it stretches from this corner to this corner. And now wherever, wherever this red line crosses the vanishing lines, this is where you will have another 
horizontal line and you, you will know that each of those distances is the same as this distance. And once you're at the end, there is not that much space left, but still some. You just draw another diagonal rule and then you just go into the opposite direction like this. And then you continue drawing lines like here. Yeah, basically that's it. Obviously you can extend them to here. And obviously things are not perfectly correct here. <laughs> so now you have a perspective grid in this room with even distances. This way you can already create a room or a street. But of course it is a little bit of work. So the most scary thing about perspective is not the difficulty, it's, it's the work. But with these basic rules you can already create quite a good one-point perspective. One thing before we go over to the two-point perspective is to remember that circles become ovals when they are foreshortened and the closer they get to the vanishing line, the flatter they get. Two-point perspective. Two-point perspective feels more natural than one-point perspective. As in real life, we barely look at things just straight like this within a room or a street. So two-point perspective makes things more dynamic and believable. Just as the name suggests, a two-point perspective has two vanishing points. Both of those points are on the same horizon line. If you have a cube, one side converges to one vanishing point and the other side converges to the other vanishing point. And every other object in the room pretty much does the same. So you can create whole backgrounds with those two vanishing points and align pretty much every line to one of them. But there are two major things to pay attention to here. The vanishing points are usually pretty far apart from each other, otherwise the objects within the panel will be too distorted at the top and at the bottom. In most panels using two-point perspective, the two vanishing points are outside of the panel or far outside of it. This creates a bit of a challenge, especially if you draw on paper. Of course you can draw outside of your panel and I would suggest you do that, but sometimes your paper is not even enough. So what artists usually do in those cases is to extend the paper by attaching another piece of paper. Digitally you can help yourself by using a digital perspective ruler. I will explain on how to use uh, the perspective tool in Clip Studio later in the video. So very few two-point perspective panels have both vanishing points within the panel. So in most panels either one vanishing point is within the panel or actually in the very most cases both of them are outside. But I will explain in a bit on how you can use certain tricks to still help you that without having to actually draw the vanishing points. Second thing you always have to pay attention to is that both of the two vanishing points are on the horizon line. And I know I already told you that, but remember in most panels the vanishing points are outside of the panel. You wouldn't believe how often I just found myself of deciding randomly where the vanishing points for each side will be, but totally forgot that they both have to be on the horizon line. So often my two-point perspectives just ended up looking weird and wonky and I just didn't know why. Until I watched the video by David Finch about perspective and he mentioned that this is a pretty common mistake amongst beginners and then it just clicked. So I reckon I'm not the only one who made this mistake by eyeballing it. That's why eyeballing is sometimes just not a solution and that's why we need to learn how perspective works properly before we start eyeballing it. So yeah, pay attention to those two mistakes and already your perspectives will probably look a lot better. Also, with two-point perspective, the same foreshortening rule applies. The closer something is to the vanishing points, the flatter it gets. Only now you have two vanishing points. How much foreshortening there is, is not that easy to tell. Again, you can draw a perspective grid with a diagonal rule and help yourself with that. Also, David Chelsea goes into the nitty-gritty on how to do foreshortening right. But to me it just looks too time consuming and it's just too, honestly, just too big brain for me. I'm, I'm too stupid to understand some of it. So if you feel like you want to really, really master it, then of course knock yourself out. But I think certain things like the cross rule or the diagonal rule are a little bit more helpful if you want to be precise, but still somewhat quick. 
There is one trick to forego the two vanishing points being too far apart. You don't actually have to drop it. perspective no that's my oh and it's so new wow wow compared to the library version of it thanks to my friend who gave away her copy because she wasn't using it thank you so much so yeah where was it anyways there is like a shortcut of not having to draw the actual vanishing points here's how you do it so first you draw a horizon line as you as per usual then figure out where about the center of the picture is gonna be. And then starting from the horizon line, measure out even distances and mark them. So let's say it's uh, one centimeter here, just for the purpose of simplicity. So next, starting on this, um, next on this side, do the same just make but make the difference somewhat smaller so let's say here we make it i don't know seven or eight millimeters yeah eight is good i think and the same here eight millimeters then you connect each of the dots Then on this side, you do the same, just make the distance somewhat smaller. Let's make it, I don't know, seven millimeters, I guess. And then do the same here, connect this dot, this dot, this one to this one, and so on. And now you have a nice two-point perspective grid without having to draw the vanishing points. And then you just use the lines as the guideline for where everything else is gonna go. Obviously you can use two-point perspective in order to show interior spaces as well. And here again it's important to place the two vanishing points far from each other to avoid distortion. And also try to think in shapes like boxes. Almost everything can kind of fit into a box within the perspective. Sometimes you can even create just an illusion of a perspective without actually using vanishing points. You just draw parallel lines like here. In some cases it works better than in others. And if you overdo it, your perspective will just look like from a synth game. But in many cases it kind of works out, especially if the background is covered with the characters in the panel. Still, if you compare it to an actual perspective, it does look a little bit more stiff, I guess. Three. Three-point perspective. With a three-point perspective you get one more additional vanishing point. But not on the horizon line, but far above or below it. Depending on which you choose, the reader is looking up or down at something. Generally, this perspective gets used the least for practical purposes. It's really dynamic and impactful, so it's better if you use it sparingly. Otherwise, you might overwhelm the reader a little bit. And also, it does cost you more time to create it. You can use it to show how big or menacing something is, or you can use it to show an overview of a place to create this kind of distance to the reader so that they don't feel like part of the scene anymore or it's literally for the basic overview to show where everything is. The most common scenery where the three point perspective is used is uh, skylines, sometimes seen from below and sometimes from above. Here the horizon line is often not even within the frame. Because when you look up, then everything that is at the height of your eyes is not within your frame of vision anymore. The third vanishing point, point is also most often outside of the panel, but can be inside sometimes. So again, 
The perspective tool in Clip Studio can be extremely useful. If you draw on paper, again, drawing a perspective grid might be a good idea. It's not always easy to figure out beforehand where the vanishing points should be. You can start by drawing a very rough sketch and then based on this sketch you can create the perspective grid or the perspective ruler. And again, you don't have to be super precise. Often it's enough to know where the third vanishing point is roughly gonna be and then as long as none of your lines step out of the line, you should be fine. Oh, and by the way, the trick of measuring even distances and connecting those dots in order to create a perspective grid, you can use it here as well, of course. And just on a small note, Perspective is not the only way of showing a three-dimensional space. There are certain other things that we already use often just automatically because we know how the world works that do show depth of a room. For example, there is overlapping. So we know that the person who is partly covered by another person is further back. You can also use different sizes. Obviously, whoever is bigger in the picture is closer to the camera. An artistic device you can use is also fading Anything that is further in the background gets thinner lines and the closer something is to the camera, the thicker the lines get. And of course you can also use the position of the objects. You know that this wagon here is further away from the camera than this wagon here, even though there is no clear perspective used here. Most of the lines are parallel. 4. Using the perspective grid. So now that we know how to create spaces roughly, you kind of have to place characters in it. Here again, if you want to be really precise, you can use the perspective grid for it. If you draw a line from the top of the head of a character to the vanishing points and then you connect the bottom of the feet to the vanishing points, then you can move the character within the space and the height of the character will stay the same as long as they stay within those two lines. And notice how the horizon line always cuts across the same space. This way you can move the character closer to the camera, then a bit to the right, then a bit to the left. And if the character is below the horizon line, let's say the distance to the horizon line is like a headspace, then if you draw a character of roughly the same height further than the background, then you also just measure like roughly their head size to the horizon line in order to still make them stand on the same level. This way you can use the perspective grid to draw anything within the room. So let's say there is like a window around here. So based on this window I want to draw a door on this side of the room. So how do I best do that? Well you can just follow the grid basically where this line is. Everything that is in this room around that line has the same height as the window. And in normal rooms doors are usually somewhat lower than windows. So we can draw a door here. So it's two squares. So if the door would be here, it would be this slim. So, okay, now we see two squares is like way too narrow for both the window and the door. So in the perspective, you don't really see that, but you can see it if you compare it to here. So it's good that we have the perspective grid. So let's try and correct that. I guess three squares would be a good width. So. Let's do that. Three squares here. Let's do it in that direction. Three squares here. All right, now we have much better door and window. A much more natural sized door and window. If you drew the window here, it would be like around this size. Obviously my grid isn't perfect. So yeah, the window would be around this size. So let's try and draw a desk as well. Maybe on this wall. Desks are usually maybe somewhat lower than windows are, so maybe about this height then because we are getting closer to the vanishing point um, the surface is gonna be pretty flat and then we have legs here. Obviously I cannot be that precise right now because I, I don't want to zoom in too far. Um, so this is just like a really rough sketch. Then you want to draw a chair in front. It's actually okay to maybe like draw just some rough squares for now. Like usually just look at your room and see like how tall is the normal chair that you would use. So maybe it's about... Again, my the pen right now is extremely imprecise and drawing 
that far I have difficulties drawing the lines where they're supposed to, but you get what I mean. So let's say you have a bookshelf, a tall bookshelf here in this corner. So if it were next to the wall, it would like maybe take up this much space. So then you just extend it a little bit to make it wider, too wide. And, and all, of course you can have a bed in this corner that we look at. And uh, maybe you have another window on this side. So three squares down to here. So yeah. Then. Once you have this rough sketch, obviously you can obviously you can do a much more clean drawing later on. Maybe even without the perspective ruler on, so you have more organic lines. The how to draw a manga perspective edition goes into a lot more depth into how to use the perspective group properly and how to place the characters in the right proportions within the room. So I uh, highly recommend this book as well. So yeah, the perspective grid on paper is kind of self-explanatory. Now let's try to use the perspective ruler in Clip Studio. Okay, so let me explain how to use the perspective ruler. First of all, you will find it here in the ruler tool. And then here is the perspective ruler. So how it works is that you create perspective by deciding where your vanishing points will be. So you draw, just start anywhere, for, draw your first vanishing line and then a second vanishing line. And where those two meet, it will create your first vanishing point as well as the horizon line. So now you have a wine point perspective. So if you draw, then all these lines will converge to here. No. All the vertical lines will snap to just be vertical. And also horizontal lines are gonna be straight. It does automatically snap to the perspective grid but of course sometimes the program doesn't quite get what you want so some lines you will have to redraw like like see here you thought I want to draw a horizontal line you thought I would draw this line so if you look over here a new layer got created once I used the perspective ruler as long as this layer is on any line you draw will snap to the perspective ruler so even if I uh, pick like the shape shape tool it will snap to the perspective grid. If you want to draw outside of the perspective grid again, you just have to make the perspective ruler layer, then you can just draw freely on another layer again. So that was one point perspective, let's create a two point perspective. So again, pick the ruler tool, the perspective ruler, so one vanishing line and second vanishing line, so we have one, the first vanishing point. And uh, let's say I want to have my second vanishing point around here, so I just draw a vanishing line here. And the second one, I have to make sure that they meet at the horizon line, so that they are, so the horizon line stays straight. If you were to put the second vanishing point not on the already existing horizon line, let's say um, here, and then I want I make the two vanishing lines meet here. The horizon line will be skewed, so it won't be like parallel to the sides of your paper anymore, which is probably sometimes what you want, but most of the times you don't. So pay attention to that. If you think like your perspective is almost right, but you want to change certain things, you can move parts of the perspective with, the, with this tool. I will look up what it is in English because here I only have the German one. So if you click on here, you, you can move different objects of this. Like for example, you can move the second vanishing point up to here. You can make it further, closer. You can also move like basically the center of the two vanishing points. Um, you can also change the vanishing lines, which I'm not sure what the purpose is, but I'm sure there is something. And also you can move the whole thing. So this way you can 
still change things even if you already have your perspective grid. And obviously now the lines snap to that grid. And you can draw freely. For the three point perspective, it's pretty much the same spear, just you add one more point. So you add one vanishing point, second vanishing point, and then you decide where your third vanishing point is gonna be. Let's say it's somewhere up there. So you just uh, draw a vanishing line here, and second one here. If you want it, the third vanishing point be exactly in the middle of these two then obviously you just try to make those two vanishing lines meet right there or you can let them meet somewhere else and now you can draw freely now every line you draw snaps to one of those three vanishing points i can already see that this perspective is definitely off doesn't feel especially natural that's why I would say it always makes more sense to have a rough sketch first and then using the perspective ruler. Because you cannot really say what the room will look like when you just randomly do it. Okay, but this is how you use the perspective tool in Clip Studio. So now that you know the basic theory of perspective, try using it in practice. Study or copy perspectives by other artists or copy photographs or Google Street to you or screenshots from movies. With time, you will gather a better feeling for the right kind of perspective. Try observing things around you and following the vanishing points. Maybe analyze your own photos by drawing in the vanishing lines and figuring out where the vanishing point is. Break down things into simple forms. Almost everything is a box. In recent years, it has become more common for artists to use programs like SketchUp in order to create their backgrounds. I personally have never used SketchUp, so I don't really know how exactly it works. And I know that my computer will definitely crash if I try to install this program. But I know that especially Webtoon artists have been increasingly using it in order to create believable, nice backgrounds for their stories. I'm not sure whether I would suggest someone who doesn't really have much understanding of perspective to try and using these programs. My intuition tells me it's probably better to s try and understand how perspective works first and create backgrounds on your own first. But I don't know. Maybe those programs help you understanding perspective better. I don't know. Also, I don't think that it's laziness if you do use those programs in order to create your backgrounds. It's not cheating either. It's the pressure. <laughs> As a manga or webtoon artist, you usually have to create a lot within the shortest time and everything has to look amazing. So if artists do use 3D programs, it's really not a big deal. In the end, what matters most is the quality of the comic, I guess. And if we expect artists to always draw backgrounds on their own, well then we should give them a f***ing break and not expect a new chapter each week. Not everyone can afford assistance. Sorry, that was a bit of a tangent. I just sometimes wish we had more time to spend on things like backgrounds. Cause they can be a lot of fun, but at the same time I know I cannot spend 10 hours on one panel. So while we work with perspective, remember just certain things like for example, the horizon line is rarely at the center of a panel. It's usually a little bit lower or a little bit higher and obviously perspective also applies to characters but drawing characters in perspective is a whole different topic of its own which I don't feel nearly skilled enough to even approach. What you can keep in mind though is that each perspective has a different effect so use it to your advantage also when you want to tell your story and want to create certain atmospheres. You can also make the whole perspective thing easier by having some perspective grids at hand already. Digitally, of course, it's easy. Just copy a perspective grid on a different layer, then use it as your guideline. Traditionally, you might need some tracing paper or maybe a tracing table and use your own pre-drawn perspective grid. In this case, I would suggest that you use different colors for each vanishing point. And also sometimes you can just use already existing drawings and then copy the perspective that that had onto your own panel. And always remember, you don't have to be 
perfect at it. As long as the space looks plausible and not totally warped, it's okay not to have a perfect perspective. And sometimes it's actually better to have a wrong perspective. A couple of years ago there was this artist who noticed a certain thing about one frame from my neighbor Totoro. If you follow the vanishing lines there, they don't actually meet at one vanishing point, but they have different vanishing points, which wouldn't really make sense in real life, but for that scene it just made more sense to make the space wider by using two different vanishing points. So I guess once you really understand perspective very well, you can bend the rules to your liking however you want. Okay, so these are some basics that will hopefully make you understand perspective somewhat better and also will help you improve your background. If you want to go further into detail, I highly recommend those two books I mostly used for this video that I already mentioned too. Perspective for Comic Book Artist by David Chelsea. At certain points he gets extremely technical, which is a little bit intimidating for me personally. In many cases I just prefer winging it and just going with my gut rather than making sure everything is perfectly aligned to the perspective, but that's probably because I'm impatient. But knowing these theories is definitely a good basis for implementing your own preferred techniques. One thing that I learned from reading this book is that the distance to the camera influences a lot on how distorted things get. The example that he names is the character that stretches out a hand to the camera. If the character is standing close to the camera, the hand is much bigger than his head. But the further away the character gets from the camera, the less the distortion gets. So if you stay far enough from the camera, even if your hand is stretched out towards the camera, it will still have the same size as if the hand would be next to your face. I think this is a very common mistake among artists. We just assume that as soon as a body part of a character is closer to the camera, it has to be bigger in proportion. But that's just not always the case. It really depends on how close the character is to the camera and how much you can see of that character. So yeah, it's a pretty good book with uh, a lot of amazing perspective drawings. And another helpful book that I used for researching this video is, as I mentioned, the perspective edition of How to Draw Manga. It explains step by step on how to draw certain backgrounds and is also quite thorough. If you follow these rules, you will definitely be able to create correct scenes and also goes a lot into depth of how to place characters within the room while still paying attention to how tall they are and so on. So it's really good. I highly recommend these two books and I am not sponsored by either of those publishers or authors, just so you know. I just really like those two books. If you read them, you will probably know almost everything you need to know about perspective. As, at least as a comic artist, you don't need to be more precise than that. I know the information in this video might be a lot. I tried to keep it simple first, but then I saw that there's actually plenty of basic information on one, two and three point perspective. So I decided to go a little bit further into depth and maybe expand upon those basic things just so that not only beginners, but also people who have some experience with perspective can take something from it. Understanding the dimensional space is not easy and believe me, I'm pretty bad at it and I still need to practice like a ton. So don't be harsh on yourself if you, if you don't master it straight away. Try to begin by applying maybe a one point perspective to one panel, then try a two point perspective and uh, maybe once in a while, try to implement a three-point perspective. Take it bit by bit, use all these helpful tools you can find. Do some sketches where you try to apply different perspectives and start roughly and then maybe add some more details. Just in general, starting small is always a good way of starting something without getting overwhelmed. Honestly, I am not sure this video is helpful at all. Also, I would have liked to edit more interesting graphics and animations in order to better underline the points I'm trying to make. But that would take a lot of time and would make me procrastinate even more because making this video was already a little bit scary. And in the end, I think putting out this video in a not perfect form is probably more helpful than not creating this video at all because it's not perfect. How many art projects never get to exist because their creators think that they have to be perfect in order to even start? So yeah, it's fine. This video is what it is and if it's helpful, 
I hope you leave a like, maybe a comment. If you don't find it helpful, you can also leave a comment and press the dislike button. I don't know. You can also follow me on my social media, like Instagram, Twitter or Facebook. And I would also like it if you subscribe to this channel, so you don't miss any new upcoming videos. The next one should be coming out in maybe two weeks, where I will be documenting my <laughs> Dokomi convention experience. So stay tuned for that. And also you can read my manga and other me online for free in German or in English. All the links will be in the description box below. Thank you all for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye!